please take a blue song book. All of our songs will be from the blue hymnal this morning. And turn to page number 13. We'll get started. Jeff here, and uh, I don't know where they are now, <laughs> but welcome everybody. Uh, a couple of announcements this morning. Uh, Agape Village, um, there's just a couple of new things in here I want you to mark your calendars for. I did talk with uh, Agape this week, and they are still putting together a list of of families for us. We're going to get a list of six families. And so uh, I want to ask right now, I asked before who wanted to be, who wanted to adopt a family. And I think there was at least six or perhaps seven different families. And I'll ask for an additional one if we need to do that. What I'm going to, what we're going to do though, as we adopt a family, what does that mean? Well, it means both that orphaned child and the foster parents, okay, that unit. So we then are adopting them. And uh, you know, it's kind of the second stage when, or the second, second tier down, perhaps we might say, of if we would like to adopt a child ourselves, but maybe we're just not in a place to do that or, or you know, right now. Well, how about if we just can help out somebody that's already doing it? Isn't that a great thing to do? Okay, so that's kind of the idea. And two things in, in conjunction with that is I have two dates written down. I want you to mark your calendars at home with this. Uh, December 13th, that is a Thursday evening. And uh, get to meet the foster families and the children at the Agape Christmas Party at John's Incredible Pizza in Modesto. I'll get you addresses and all that stuff, but you can look it up. <laughs> Anyway, John's Incredible Pizza, there will be a, there is a fee for getting into it, um, obviously to cover the, the, the cost of the pizzas and, and whatever costs that they might have. Uh, I'll let you know what that is. 
but but mark that on your calendar. This will be the first chance to be able to meet some of those some of those families, okay, and some of the kids. There's usually a lot of kids. He says on an average they have about 60, 70 kids. Oh, we're from little ones up to you know through the teenage years, and so uh, plan on that. And then on December 15th, and this is tentative. It's a Saturday where our, I'm calling this Adopt-A-Family meeting and gift giving is going to take place. Now I told you we can't go to their house, okay, because the house needs to remain a secret. <laughs> and that's a part of the adoption process and the, the, so that the, the families to, of which these children have been taken from don't find out where they're living. That's, that's why it's to protect them, okay? But we can go to the Agape Village office and meet those families, and so that's what's being arranged. Mm -hmm. And so the tentative date for that is Saturday morning over a period of about two hours. Each family is going to meet in a, in a room together um, for a, oh, 20 minutes, 30 minutes or so, just a brief time to kind of get to know each other just a little bit and bring them some gifts. And we're gonna be bringing a gift to the children and also for the parents, just a, a simple, very simple. I'll give you some suggestions and ideas as I find out more about that, okay? So I just want you at this stage, please mark those two dates on your calendar, okay? The one is the, the, is the Agape family party or the, their party there, and then the other would be actually those are gonna be adopting someone, uh, and we will have another meeting to confirm all of that later. So we're making some progress. It's been a little slow, but we are making some progress and keeping everything legal and, and proper as we, as we go through this. Announcements, any other announcements? Shelly. Um, also mark on your calendar, Tuesday, December 11th, oh, yes. um, six o'clock, we're going to do the gingerbread making for children. Um, and we'll be inviting children from outside the church that we know. So um, we do need volunteers that would like to help make gingerbread dough and bake some um, houses for us um, so we can put them together pre-made <coughs> kind of stuff okay. um, if you're not into baking you're more than welcome to give crystal the money for her to go get all the stuff and bake it herself so okay let me just say it this way then if you if you're coming to the party come you are invited yes okay um yes. and i guess you need helpers to we would love help so okay. If you want to be involved, just ask Christmas. If you like gingerbread houses, talk to Shelly. Or Charlie's Christmas, Charlie Brown's Christmas movie, because that's funny too. So if you like that, come watch that too. So is that happening at the same time? Mm -hmm. We're just going to play it at the same time, because some kids won't want to decorate. So. Okay. <laughs> so if you're interested in gingerbread houses, be here for, for that time. Okay. Talk to Shelly, whether it would be that you would make gingerbread yourself, and, and donate that or you want to give some money to Crystal maybe and Crystal's going to become the, the, the baker and uh, take care of those extra houses that are needed. A good, good opportunity then to witness to people okay and to introduce people to the church here as well. Okay good. Other announcements? Jeff. I would like to ask prayers for those people of Paradise in that area that have been Man, it's been so decimated up there, it's really bad. In particular, I have a high school classmate who was living up in Concow with her husband. They've lost their property. He had some smoke inhalation, they just barely got out. Their dog's in the bed with burned feet, so they were both treated at a hospital for burns and the inhalation that he had. Okay. They're safe, they're sound, and uh, we've had other friends get in touch with them, and we've been relaying information back and forth. Uh, it's Helena and Bob Modell, M-O-D-E-L-L. -L. Um, that's, uh, that's uh, a couple. Uh, their kids are up there now helping out with them as well. Okay. But, uh, so we will pray for the fire victims, and there's, there are several... Um, you know, some other people have mentioned people that they knew or know, excuse me, that they know in areas, and there's been a lot of people affected. So we I've will run into several we will pray for the last couple of days. Pray for those either have family or friends. Good. Okay. Other prayer requests. 
Rick? Good morning, Rachel. I'm not feeling good this morning. So if you just pray for your health. Most of the morning, I think. <coughs> Crystal? Um, continue to pray for me and my brother. Um, we won't know exactly what's going to happen with my dad until Wednesday. Um, and if it takes a turn for worse, then we're going to have a lot of planning and moving and stuff to do. So I'm going to be really stressed out, so please keep us in your prayers. Will do. All right. Okay. So Barry? And Gary Ellis, I have something for Gary Reed. I was just going to bring up Barbara Smith's son, also lost his home and all his possessions. Everything except what was on his back. For those of you that don't know Barbara Smith, she's been meeting with us on Thursday evenings out at uh, Gary and Alice's house. She's a Christian, um, and so her son has lost his home as well. Does anybody know if Barbara and her husband still live up there? They would have lived in paradise for a while. I, okay, Barb, now we're talking about Barbara Sowell. Right. And uh, I don't know. It's been, she, Carrie, you, you talked with Barbara her on the phone. It's been, been quite a while. Um, she was taking care of her father, and I don't know where he lives. Okay. So I'm not sure if they're still living all right. Okay, let's go to prayer. Our mighty God, we want to thank you, Lord, for bringing us together, for uh, just the joy that we can have in service to you. And Lord, there are uh, right now a lot of hardships that are taking place because of this fire and uh, people that have uh, suffered greatly. And so we want to pray for them, God. We pray for those that have lost homes and uh, and. Uh, just been devastated uh, through this and so we, we pray for your strength and your peace be with them God and uh, Lord we also want to pray for uh, Lauren and Rachel who are now sick and at home and pray God that you would uh, help them to recover quickly from that Lord, we want to pray for uh, Crystal um, and for the whole situation with her father God I just pray that uh, your will be done and that you would give Crystal and, uh, and her brother strength to do whatever is necessary in, in this situation. And uh, God, I just thank you that we can come to you and uh, bring our requests to you at any time. And so we just pray that you be with us as we uh, continue in our service. And uh, Father, just uh, we just pray that these things that we do, the things that we, uh, the songs we sing, the message that we hear will just bring glory to your name. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, our next song is number 79.
verses 1 and 3, 1 and 3.
page number 73. The song is called Worthy is the Lamb. We want to sing this as we prepare our hearts to take the Lord's Supper together. Page 73. <clears throat> Just to, to borrow from the imagery of, of uh, that song there, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Um, that comes from Revelation. But uh, the imagery of a, a sacrificial lamb is something that's present so, uh, so far through um, the time of Israel. And uh, the Passover lamb had just such great significance to them of an unblemished and spotless lamb offered to avert... Uh, the penalty of sin uh, that God was bringing upon um, people who didn't believe in him and it was to uh, to signify that the Israelites were under God's protection that they were uh, his people and that's uh, what I'd like us to read here in Romans is so fitting for that it says for while we were still weak at the right time Christ died for the ungodly for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are, are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. And what didn't get told in, in the symbology in the, the, the Passover lamb is uh, true forgiveness of sins. That was just pushed forward and pushed forward again until the hope of the Messiah, you know, what was promised to Abraham um, so far back before even the nation of Israel. Until Jesus would arrive, sins were just rolled back. But we see in Jesus... Not only are we you know, forgiven of those sins, but there's something that's beyond even that. By his death, the shedding of his blood were cleansed, and by his life, we are given eternal hope. And that's what we remember at communion, is that we've been cleansed from the sin, the unrighteousness that we have, and we've been given hope of eternal life. So we'll take some time to think about that, and then Rick and Silas will pray.
Please pray with me. Father, as we come to you today um, with our hearts on you and the sacrifice of Christ for each one of us, we come to you with humble hearts and with great thanksgiving, remembering Barry just said that our sins are not just roll away. They're not just kicked down the road. Um, we understand that when Jesus died, he, <clears throat> as that perfect lamb, he removed that sin completely from us so that we have the, the hope of standing before you and knowing that we can be blameless and sinless before you in a worthy manner. And I just ask, Father, that we can understand that. So give us that understanding um, of what that means for each one of us to, to have that sin, have our sins removed from us entirely and, and forgotten by you. And I ask, Father, that as we remember the sacrifice of Jesus, that you can bless this bread that represents that broken body the body that was broken because of our sins and the pain and suffering that Jesus went through. Um, please keep that on our hearts. And, uh, and I ask these things through your, through your son, Jesus. Our Father in heaven, Lord, I want to take this time to thank you for the sacrifice of your son the only sacrifice that was sufficient to wash away our sins. The only being in the universe who had perfection, who was perfect, who still is perfect in that you came to earth and died for such as me. Lord, we thank you for the perfect blood that is worthy to wash away our sins. And we humbly thank you. And in Jesus' name, amen.
thank you for all your singing this morning. I enjoyed that very much. And uh, give your attention now, please, to our brother Paul. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's good to be back. I enjoyed the trip. But it was uh, it was like living in a whirlwind. I think we we got down by the Jordan River near Jericho several times, and Elijah was still spinning down there somewhere. <laughs> but uh, no, we saw so many just amazing things, things that I've read about my whole life, and I, I know I've been over there several times, but I've always been in the same spot because I'm busy working. So it was good to drive around on a bus and stay in hotels and just look at stuff. And feel free to talk to Rick and Penny. I've told Rick already that I'm expecting him to develop a geography class with lots of pictures about the places we visited. And don't you think? Would you guys like to see that? I'll loan him all my pictures plus their pictures. He's going to have a bang up. Thousands of pictures. I think I took, I may have taken a couple thousand pictures myself. You guys likewise so anyway it was good it's a uh, it's a faith builder I mean I don't know about you guys but the place that I thought was the most astounding was we had walked through Hezekiah's tunnel slopping in the water if you want to see what it's like I posted a video 22 minutes 33 seconds that's how long it took us to go through and the whole thing's there and it's slosh 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 and sometimes it's slosh 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 like this right <laughs> But uh, when we popped out the other end, we were at the Siloam Pool. They just found it within the last 10 years. A sewer line broke. And the sewer line, when the sewer line broke, they had to dig down and they went, whoa, we got something here. And so they've just exposed the, the what would it be, the eastern edge of the pool, sort of the little plaza. It, the rest of it's underneath of a, I think it's a Greek Orthodox monastery in their garden. And, they don't want anybody to dig it up and collapse their garden from 20 feet up. So anyway, but from there, we went back into a, through a gate and into a tunnel. And you know what we were walking on? The right-hand edge of the street from Jesus' time. So when he went to the Siloam pool and then he went on up into, toward the temple, we're walking on the same stones. Most places you walk in Jerusalem, you're anywhere from 30 to 60 feet above the level where Jesus walked. But we know he was there. And we know he walked up that street. However, we took a side turn and went up into the sewers of the city. And so we went in places Jesus didn't walk as well, right, Rick? So anyway, that, to me, that was just astounding that, you know, we had seen the Jerusalem model. And there's that street with all the steps in it. And then we walked right up the edge of it. So, yeah, that's, that's pretty astounding. Anyway, uh, it's Veterans Day today. Did you know that? 11-11 yep. marks the end of the armistice for the First World War, where millions of men shot each other to death and blew each other up with artillery shells for about five years time you get old then about four years 14 to 18 and that's that's when it came to end and it's morphed into a holiday to honor uh, those who served our country in the armed services through the years and when we look back at the conflicts in our history and the men and women who served it really should be with some gratefulness on, on our part, isn't it? Do you guys feel that way? Yes. You go out to lunch today, buy lunch of a veteran that you know some, because that guy's a walk-in, you can tell. I've seen one day we were in a, mm. Jeff, you can start with Jeff. Um, no, we walked into a restaurant and this guy had brought his dad in. His dad was in his World War II uniform. Mm. Wow. And I'm eating dinner with a friend of mine named Mike and we said to the waiter, grab their tag. Whew, snatched it up, got it, paid it. Just because, man, it's just something we should be grateful for. I'm still awed 
by those who were willing to die for a cause that they believed was greater than their own life. I still remember standing at the washroom where my uncle's bomber squadron, the 579th Squadron, 8th Air Force, there's a little hut that they used for a bathroom and those guys had to go in there every morning before they took off for a mission and look themselves in the eye. And at that time, the early, when they had no fighter cover, the odds were greater that you would die or be shot down than it was that you would come home. And they had to look themselves in the eye and you know what they did? They went and got on their planes and left. And so I had two uncles who didn't come home. Um, during World War II, an amazing 12.2% of the population served in the military. Over 16,300,000 altogether. And if you look at the demographics of the time and you factor out those people who were elderly, the children, uh, the majority of the women in the population, what you find is that nearly half of the people who were eligible to serve said, I'll do it. That's amazing. That is amazing. Men from right here, men like Charlie Bonnet and Elliot Fleming, Marion Hull and his two brothers, um, all volunteered to do that. Jim Brown up in Sacramento was another one who volunteered to go. Men that we knew and admired, and I, and I think sometimes when we talk about the service or going in the service, we really don't think enough about those who are over there serving those of us who are still here at home. But they have, and they do. James isn't here this morning. He's the only other veteran right now, isn't he? I think James Garcia. So the next time you see James, shake his hand, tell him thanks. Okay. Right now, here in the United States, there are over 20 million living veterans who were servants of the other 300 million who stayed at home. Over 20 million who served with a whole heart for their country and their people. And um, this, none of that is spiritual in that sense, but you know what, on a very human level, we need to say thank you. We really do. Let's see here. If I turn it on, maybe it'll work. I was supposed to show you that a while ago. By the way, that was the next, uh, no, yeah, next to the last day we were there. and We were down by the Dead Sea, and God was putting on a light show for us. So pretty spectacular stuff. Um, this morning I want to talk about whole hog Christianity. Now that's sort of a... A country-fied expression, isn't it? You might say, or a southern, southern expression. But, but what does the phrase whole hog mean? Can you help me out here? Everything. What's that? It means you're going to do it no matter what. It's everything. Okay, so everything. And any other words you can think of? All in. All in. Full use. use What's that? Use the whole thing. Use the whole thing, okay. Anybody else? James? Completely. Complete, that's a good one. Did we run out of vocabulary? We need to play some more bethumped, I think. So here, here's the synonyms that I just quickly got from the internet. Thorough, wholesale, comprehensive, radical, extensive, exhaustive, all-encompassing, uncut, uncensored, entire, full, outright, in-depth, intensive, full-scale, encyclopedic, sweeping, and complete. Is that enough for us? Did we get the we got the idea, right? So if we're gonna go whole hog, we're all in, as Denny said. Well, Denny's from Reno, so you know that's a that's a poker term, right? You push all in, right? But it means the same thing. You, there's, you're not holding anything back. Not holding any, anything back. Now you want to see whole hog? There's whole hog. Nine hundred and eighty-six pounds. New state record in the state of Arkansas, which is where they have the Arkansas Razorbacks, right? Yeah, that's there's a Razorback for you. I figured that was the whole hog, right? Something to picture in our mind. 
So what's my point talking about veterans other than angling for the veteran vote my next election, you know? My point is this, that these veterans are the most visible representation to us of what it means to serve with a whole heart, to go whole hog, to put everything on the line for family, friends, and even complete strangers. So thank you to the veterans, young and old. Like I said, to go out to lunch today, buy somebody's dinner for them. It won't break you up and it'll mean something to them. We, as Christians, have been called on by God to serve. But do we really know or do we really <coughs> live out what it means to serve God or to serve our brothers and sisters whole hog without reservation? To love without regard to self or self-service? I want us to look at our text in 1 Peter this morning and then I want to follow it up with a parallel text from the book of John. So let's start with 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 17. It says this, If you address as Father the one who partially judges according to each one's work. Now, if we're Christians, how do we start our prayers? Father in heaven, right? The most common phrase that we use. Sometimes, dear God, a lot of times, it's Father in heaven. So who's he talking to here? He's talking to people who are Christians. And he's, it's a different way of saying, if you're a Christian, da, da, da. No, he says, if you address his father, in other words, if you claim sonship or daughtership of God, listen up. He says, uh, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. I'm not going to talk about this fear thing this morning. But you know what fear means here? Be afraid. Don't fall for all the modern, oh, it's respect, and it's, you know, we got to give God his due. No, it says fear, and it means fear. Serve God with fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life, inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood, as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of who? You, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your souls, here's our call to action this morning, since you've, in obedience, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. It's pretty direct, isn't it? Let's look at what Jesus said. John 15, 12 through 14. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the father will give you. This is my command, love each other. Or love one another, if you got the New American Standard there. What is it that Jesus is demanding of us here? Both in Peter's words and in his own. It appears to me that he is demanding that we will serve each other like heroes. Jesus' words to his disciples are, love each other. I mean, this is some of the last things that, that Jesus says to them. And he says, love each other. Peter's words years later are, fervently love one another from the heart. But what does that look like? 
Books have been written by the thousands and thousands about heroic feats in warfare. Movies are made about extraordinary feats. Documentaries are produced for the History Channel or Discovery or the Learning Channel. But to what end? Well, they're, they're done to share the stories of heroes who risk everything. To share the stories of those who, in the words of Abraham Lincoln, gave the last full measure of devotion. And now, Jesus is demanding that of us? That, that we have to die? Peter's demanding our lives? That we have to die for our brothers and sisters? Maybe. That, that might be what it means, and certainly we have examples from history about that happening. But maybe it's not that exactly. Because we can be in, in really tight situations and we can nerve ourselves up for an emergency. We can, we can respond on adrenaline. But I think Jesus is asking something harder. He uses this word, these words, lay down his life for his friends. And we can read that and say, well, that means to die. Does it? Jesus isn't asking for our death. He's asking for our life. Can we lay down our life? That's a daily process, isn't it? We, we are laying down our life, meaning that we give it up so that our brother or sister is better off. Does that make sense? Peter's saying that our purification that we have as Christians is not just for our own salvation, but it's for the well-being of our Christian community. Both complementary passages are really asking the same question. What does it mean to serve Christ and our Christian family with our whole being? Isn't that really what they're driving at here? What does it mean to go whole hog? What does it mean to shove everything in? What does it mean, comprehensive Christianity? Well, I think first of all, we can look at it this way. Fervent loving means serving others with the self-denial of Christ. We need examples, don't we? What does it mean? Well, there's some people who have some pretty sketchy ideas about what self-denial is about. But we can certainly look at Jesus. <coughs> look here in John chapter 12, beginning in verse 23. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Verily, very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while everyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. Where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Jesus uses this illustration of the principle he's trying to drive home about himself. He's, I mean, hours from dying. And he said, he, he didn't say, I'm like this, but he's saying, I'm like a grain of wheat. They all knew what that was. The farmers were all over in that country. And they would save the wheat seeds and they would scatter them out on the ground. And he said, if the wheat seed stays in the bag, it's absolutely worthless. It doesn't do anything. But if it dies, it's going to produce. They're going to produce many seeds. And when he said the hour has come, he was talking about himself. The hour had come for the grain of wheat to fall to the ground, to be planted in the soil, to begin to bear fruit. Jesus said he was going to be the most fruitful when he gave himself up. Then Jesus follows up with this. He who loves his life loses it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it to eternal life. Why is it so hard to die to self? I'm assuming all of us struggle with that. Do we have trouble dying to self? Why is it so hard? Why is it so hard to quit believing that our dreams and our desires and our lusts of the flesh 
are God's desires and God's aims. Because people have trouble separating that. We want to have God, the Heavenly Father, approve of us. But we want Him to approve of us as we keep serving ourselves and somehow try to spiritualize our own desires. If you don't believe me, turn on your television on Sunday morning. There's preachers making millions of dollars and no, I will never quit talking about them. They do not deserve your time. They do not deserve your money. They're out there to serve themselves and somehow make what you want what God wants. And Jesus looks at us and he says, if you don't hate your life in this world, I'm not going to be able to preserve it for eternal life. We can make believe that our wants are God's desires. But the reality is we just have an awfully hard time killing the old selfish self. Why do we resist so hard when we're pressed into uncomfortable areas that bend and twist us into places that we're not willing to go? Well, one thing is that we're just in love with mortal life. We are. We do everything in our power to preserve our life, don't we? Maybe the exception is if our kids are in danger, right? But not too many other things. I think that what happens is that we want to pamper ourselves to the exclusion of a better life for ourselves and real life in Christ. And the real irony is this, no matter how much we love ourselves, and no matter how much we live for this life, we cannot keep it. Humanity is a 100% fatal disease, right? Uh, I forget, I heard it expressed another way that it's like human beings are a parasite with a 100% fatality rate, something like that. But it's true. It's a 100% fatality. How many people do we know, even from scripture, that didn't end up dying? Two. Their names are? Enoch and Elijah. Enoch and Elijah. So if your name doesn't start with E, forget it. You're already out, right? <laughs> oh. oh, man. <laughs> it's 100% fatal. And so no matter how much time we devote to ourselves, and no matter how much we pamper ourselves, we're going to die anyway. So let's revise the equation somehow, because the way that we live isn't consistent with the way things are going to end. It doesn't matter how much we love our mortal life, we cannot keep it. In the book of James, he described this life as a vapor. You know, the, the smoke that wafts up from an already extinguished candle. The, the wisp of fog that burns off the surface of the lake, the last one, as the sun comes up. That's all life is. Loving this life, living for this life, I don't know, it's almost like falling in love with a reflection. You know, it, it's going to disappear just like that. And yet we do it over and over again to our own destruction. And so you have to ask, how do we fix that? How do we fix it? What is it that keeps dragging us back into things that, that we know really aren't good for us? Well, Jesus said the problem is we need to get pruned up. We really do. He said, speaking to his disciples, that the only way we can really get over self is to let him prune away the old wood, the dying wood, and do what with it? Burn it. Don't go get to go back and put it back on again. No, you burn it up. Get, set it aside and burn it. It's the natural way of fruit bearing trees and vines to require pruning. I mean, we see it around us here every winter, don't we? As soon as the trees have had enough cold, the pruning goes forward. And why do the farmers prune? Let me guess here. They hate the limbs that they chop off and put on the ground because they just hate them. Uh, they want to injure the trees. They are killers or sadists that relish cutting and burning. Have I hit any? Am I right yet? Have I got there? No, not really. I'm being facetious, obviously. It's simply because it's the only way to make the trees produce fruit of good quality and sufficient quantity. 
And in some years, it's the only thing that keeps the trees from being broken down with useless, worthless, undersized, underdeveloped fruit that crowd the tree and do damage that's irreparable. We've seen it. You see the ones where the tree didn't get pruned enough and what happens? All the limbs are on the ground and they all die anyway. <sighs> you know, we really need to pray this prayer. Lord, prune me. Prune me. Cut it off. Burn it up. You bold enough to say that prayer? Prune me. Take away the dead wood, the diseased limbs. Make me productive and useful. Make me able to see past the useless appendages to my life. And help me fervently reach out to my brothers and sisters. Lord, let us be ready to be pruned so that we can live and bear fruit that will last through the ages. Especially as we, once that stuff's gone, we can actually get into the lives of our brothers and sisters and help them as well. Number two, serving others as Jesus served is what serving really means. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side. Where did he leave from? Where we left from, right over in that same area, right? He was up on the northeast corner, Bethsaida, or maybe farther to the, to the east. And he got in the boat. Uh, they got in the boat while he sent the crowds away. After he'd sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray when it was evening, he was there alone, but the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, so the wind was contrary. In the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take courage! It is I! Do not be afraid! Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. By the way, you know, Peter's usually portrayed as a failure in this story. Did you see any of the other disciples having enough nerve to get out of the boat? It ain't happening, baby, right? Um walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, You have little faith. Why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind stopped. And those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are certainly God's son. I think there's a bunch of lessons that we can learn from this little story here. But we can learn about serving, I think, from seeing what Jesus did. First, the first thing I think we can learn here, though, is that we need to look to Jesus in the storms of life. There's all different kinds of storms that hit us, aren't there? D different things just plow into us. Some storms are correctional in nature. God used a real storm to slap Jonah around and get him turned around and headed back on the right course, right? I mean, their boat was going to sink, and he finally said, okay, I give. Throw me overboard. I know God's after me. He went overboard, and the, the ship was saved, and he had three days to think about it. Uh, some storms come to perfect us, uh, mold us, to cause us to grow in character. Paul says that suffering produces perseverance, Perseverance produces a character, and character produces hope. James said it this way, Consider it joy when we face trials, because the testing of our faith develops perseverance, and when perseverance finishes its work, we will be mature, complete, lacking nothing. Storms are something that, believe it or not, we don't like it, but we need them. We need them to come into our life. Jesus used the storm to come to his disciples with a lesson for them and us about how to live our lives in service to Him.
The primary lesson from this story is that we should expect God to do unbelievable things in our lives. But the question is, do we? Do we believe that? The apostles thought Jesus was a ghost because they never expected he could or would walk on water. They never expected Jesus to do such an unbelievable thing. And when they saw him, they all went, it's a ghost, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's unheard of. But you know what? If we really will sit and assess what's going on in our lives, especially as Christians, we can realize that God has already done some unbelievable things in our lives. Just the fact that we have life and health and strength to come and gather on a Sunday morning, man, that's the grace of God. That's a gift. Um, those of you who have been through some hard physical times and you're here this morning, man, what a blessing. God's already done unbelievable things for you, right? He's made it possible for us even to be saved from our sins. You know, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's unbelievable. That's more unbelievable than Jesus walking on the water. He's forgiven our sins because in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. In fact, Scripture tells us all blessings, in the book of James, all blessings come down from the Father of lights. That all spiritual blessings are in Jesus Christ. The example of Jesus on the sea, the lake, should lead us to acknowledge the unbelievable things that God has done for us. Have you thought about it that way? Perhaps, uh, perhaps we should just give up the rest of our time and we can all sit and think about that. Jot a note down. Think about some of the unbelievable things God's done. But if we consider what Jesus did with the disciples there and what he's already done for us, it should lead us to expect him to continue to do unbelievable things for us, by us, with us, through us, and in us. It should. That if God did it once, he's going to continue to do those things. Let's look at Peter in this story as, uh, as an example of how to serve with a whole heart. Peter says in verse 28, Lord, if it is you, tell me to come where you are. If you notice, Peter doesn't say, can I, may I, or will you let me, or any of those things. He said to him, command me to come out. Tell me to come out. Why did Peter do that? First, I think it was because he knew that anything Jesus commanded him to do, he would empower him to do. Do we believe that? Perhaps Peter was remembering back a couple of months when Matthew chapter 10, uh, Jesus sent the disciples out and he said this to them, as you go, preach this message, the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy and drive out the demons. Man, can you imagine? These guys are fishermen. They're zealots. They're tax collectors. They're all these kind of motley crew that have been hanging around with Jesus. And all of a sudden he looks at, they've been watching him do miracles, right? And all of a sudden he looks at them and he said, nope, it's your turn. You go out there and you do these things. Commanded them to go. And what happened? The disciples went out and did exactly what Jesus commanded them to do. Jesus empowered them to do what he had told them. Folks, this is, a, this is a principle we need to understand. I mean, we could sit in our living rooms and say, there's no way 
we can bring our neighbors to Christ. There's no way we can teach a class. There's no way I can serve in some other capacity in the church. There's no way, way I can give up my favorite sin. We can say those things. We can say to Jesus, you might as well tell me to walk on water. And you know what? It's true. We can't do any of those things in and of ourselves. We can't lusting. We can't stop lying. We can't stop cheating. We can't stop addiction. We, we can't do any of those things in and of ourselves. And then Peter comes alongside us and whispers, take it from me, guys. What he commands you to do, he empowers you to do. God empowers us to be converted, changed, transformed, and born again people. He empowers us to become instruments of righteousness and living sacrifices. He empowers us to say no to ungodliness, worldly lust, and to live sober, upright, godly lives in this present age. God will empower us to do those things if we'll take them up on it. We desperately need to get a hold of this concept. We need to believe it, we need to accept it, and then we need to live it out in our lives. Like I said, we think of Peter as failing in the story, but Peter wanted to be with Jesus regardless of the risk, and he knew that whatever God commands us to do, he empowers us to do, and so he got out of the boat and he started walking toward Jesus. Do you believe that God will empower you to do what Jesus has called you to do? Do you believe that? Enough to act on it? Second thing Peter realized is that it is better to be with Jesus without a boat than it is, than it is to be <clears throat> in a boat without Jesus. Ever think about that? How many guys were in the boat? Eleven of them, as far as we know. They were all there. And Peter's out of the boat because Peter thought it was better to be out there with Jesus than sitting there with the waves crashing over him in the boat. Peter understood that it was better to be out in the lake with the waves and the lightning and the wind and the thunder and the boat sinking and all of those things that were going on than to be in the boat without Jesus. Now, I have to ask you, is this crazy talk? Am I just blathering on and uh, you're cr no. am I some might think so but I have to say no way it's not crazy talk we can say to Jesus I don't want to get out of the boat like the 11 did I don't like it it's too risky or we can follow Peter's example and say I'll take the chance Many years ago, my mother sent me a poem that she wanted me to have. She talked to me on the phone about it and sent it to me. It's called, Three Dollars Worth, Please. Three dollars worth. I would like to buy three dollars worth of God. Not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep, but just enough to equal a cup of warm milk or snooze in the sunshine. I don't want enough of God to make me love a black man or pick beats with a migrant. I want ecstasy, not transformation. I want the warmth of the womb, not a new birth. I want about a pound of God in the paper sack. I would like to buy $3 worth of God, please. What it comes down to is that we really want God the encourager. We want God the comforter. We want God the forgiver, God the provider, God the protector, the sustainer. We want the God filled with mercy and grace. And we want to behold the goodness of God. But too often we don't want enough of God to really change our life. Just give me $3 worth of God. Give us the pound of the eternal in a paper sack, right? And I'll take it with me. We want to be too often where the rest of the apostles are in the back of the boat, content with having Jesus in the vicinity, but not desiring to have him up close out on the waves like Peter did.
You know, this is what can be so dangerous about coming to church on Sundays. Unfortunately, we can become comfortable with having Jesus in the vicinity one day a week. But when we come to grips with the scripture, Jesus is going to challenge us to become real seven days a week Christians. Jesus is going to challenge us to follow his example and get out of the boat and get into the storm to start going through the storms of life ourselves with him and then start going out into the storm to others in their leaky boats and challenge them to leave their boats and get out into the storm with us. Peter wanted to be with Jesus regardless of the risk, and he knew that it was better to be with Jesus without a boat than to be in the boat without Jesus. And if we aspire at all to serve others with the example of Christ, we must, we must want to be where Jesus is regardless of the risk. We must realize that it's better to be with Jesus without a boat than to be in the boat without Jesus. Not Peter, us. Not the other disciples, us. We must keep our eyes on Jesus regardless of the circumstances. And I think we can also learn to cry out to Jesus regardless of our failures. Because we do kind of look down on Peter a little bit that he, he looked away from Jesus and started looking at the waves and he sunk. What did he do though? Did he turn to the guys in the boat and said, throw me a life ring? No, he looked at Jesus and said, save me. Jesus reached down and saved him. Have you seen that picture, by the way, of you're under the water and you see this hand reaching under the water to, to grab a hold of? Great picture. That's Peter under the water. That's what that picture was about. I know all that stuff's kind of scary, isn't it? Not safe, but kind of like the lion in the Chronicles of Narnia. Jesus isn't safe. He's not. But he's faithful and he's consistent. He's going to help us through. Number three, let's finish this off. Serving means serving others with a Jesus attitude. John chapter 3, the passage is really from verse 1 through verse 17. I'm just going to read part of it. Jesus got up from supper and laid aside his garments and taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he said this, If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet, for I gave you an example that you should also do as I did to you. Many years ago at family camp, Dave Graman taught from this passage about the Enkambama or the Lintion towel. I'm talking about the service towel. Because he, he got up and he took off his main clothing and he just wrapped his towel on his waist like he was a slave, right? He goes around and starts washing them up. But why would he do that? This is his last chance to teach and, and one of his lessons is to, to dress like a slave and to pick up the basin. What, what was it that motivated Jesus to pick up the basin and the towel? And I have to say what it was. It was his attitude. Is that, look at what Paul says in Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Have this, what? Attitude in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. <coughs> Have this attitude. It was just built into Jesus. Who, although existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and boy, I mean, he went all, in this case, in this, this lesson from John, he did that. I mean, he went right to the dress and what, he was doing the slave's job. Why? Because he had attitude. He'd emptied himself for something else. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And, and maybe that's part of the lesson is that Jesus is thinking ahead over the next few hours and he's just being as humble as he can. That, I mean, you, you realize these guys walked around in streets that had 
animals all over them every day. You know what was on their feet, right? Jesus said, yep, I'll take that job. We don't have a slave here. I'll be the slave, right? How do we, how do we love each other fervently? How do we try to grab onto some of these things and put them into our lives? Attitude. So Paul says, have this attitude in you which was in Jesus. <coughs> Change your attitude. What can we learn from these verses? What's the lesson? Jesus put on and wore that Lentian towel to no personal gain. What did Jesus get out of this experience? What did he receive? Nothing, right? He was laying down his life for his friends, living his life out to the very end for them. You think Jesus understood the loving fervently that Peter's calling us to this morning? He was willing to do anything for those men to get them prepared. Didn't matter what it was. So how do we get there? Let's look back at the verses that precede these words in verses 1 through 4. Therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Now look at this. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. Does that trouble any of you? Hello? Does me. I'll admit it. That's one of mine right there. Selfishness and empty conceit. You're smart. Where'd that come from? You're handsome. Where'd you get that? You see, we don't have anything to do with our great attributes. They've been given to us, right? Uh, but with humility of mind, what? Regard one another as more important than yourselves. How are you going to love somebody fervently? If they're more important to you than you are, that fervent love's going to come right along, isn't it? Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also the interests of others. Paul is in perfect agreement with Peter about how to live with and love with our Christian brothers and sisters. If we regard them as more important than ourselves, we indeed will be willing and able to love them with passionate, uninhibited love. It's going to happen because they're so important to us. Our text this morning has been John 15, 12 through 14, and 1 Peter 1, 17 through 22, where we're exhorted with these words, greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. And that's talking about our living, not our dying, and fervently love one another from the heart. When Jesus asks us to lay down our lives, he's asking for what we have before we die, and everything we have until we die. And when Peter exhorts us to love one another from the heart, he's asking us to go beyond the rote, the sort of expected, to the extraordinary in what we do and how we regard our fellow Christians. I admire us as a church on how we respond to needs. You know, to reach out, we're talking about orphans. We're reaching out to orphans. We're reaching out to missionaries. We're reaching out to those who are in prison, we're trying to minister to the sick and the infirm, even within the church in their time of need. Earlier this fall, I guess it was summer, spring, whenever it was, a whole bunch of you showed up here to sand and scrape and tape off and mask. And you know what? One day we painted this whole building. Why? Because people are willing to give of themselves. And, and I admire that. But you know what? We need to do just as much about the spiritual life of the church. How are we doing with the need to build up spiritual life in the body? Have you invited people to church lately? Or to Bible study? Or just have a conversation about God? Have you aspired in any way to improve yourself spiritually or to improve the life of one of your brothers or sisters how long has it been since we denied ourselves so that our brother or sister would be built up in the lord if we know the need both for the body and for our personal spiritual lives the question is are we willing to take the cure 
Sometimes Jesus cures are pretty rough. You know, get out of the boat and get out here. It's a rough cure. Are we willing to stand up and be countered? Are we willing to step out of the boat of illusory comfort into the wild and tossing sea of discomfort and uncertainty? Because those are the things that bother us. I would say this from these passages that God is asking each of us to take up a towel of the servant and to be at work in the kingdom. To fill, fulfill Paul's challenge to the Ephesian church to live our lives performing those tasks that God has already created for us, we might be doing them. To rip ourselves forcefully from the everyday stuff that clutters our lives and, and just start filling our niche in the eternal. We might want to have more than just $3 worth of God in a paper sack. Amen? Brother Dan. I got kind of long-winded, so you can't give me too much time off, right? <laughs> Once again, in the Blue Songbooks, page 517 will be our closing song today. And what is the key, really, to loving others? I think the key to all of that is to see that Jesus loved us first. And so once we truly understand that, then it becomes a more natural process. <coughs> something that has to be worked at for sure. It's something that we can do. Let's all stand together and sing this. 517, freely, freely.
thing we ask. All of us ask, Father, is that you prune us so we can have some new growth in our lives, such spiritual lives. And help us, Father, to be faithful and continue looking in your word and reading every day so that we get the right input, Father, in our lives, the direction and instructions of your love. Thank you, Father God, for Paul's message, for Danny's message in Sunday school this morning. A really fruitful to my heart. I was blessed. Thank you, Father God, for all the fellowship we have here and the love of the family of God. In Jesus' name.